to get started. So I want to thank everyone this afternoon for joining us. We are so happy to be with you here from Farnsworth Art Museum on this lovely main afternoon. Uh, my name is Gwendolyn Loomis-Smith. I'm Phyllis Wyeth, Director of Learning and Engagement. And actually, I've recently joined Farnsworth Art Museum, and I'm just thrilled to be here uh, and so happy to have Jane with us here this afternoon. Um, this afternoon, we present the Stephen May and Catherine B. Wilson lecture, which focuses on the art of the book, past and present. Katie Wilson and her late husband, Stephen, had a vision and a passion to share the future growth and accessibility of the Farnsworth Library. And in fact, the Farnsworth Library was created through the bequest of the museum's founder, Lucy Copeland Farnsworth. The library you may know is in fact the only publicly accessible library in the state of Maine uh, solely devoted to art. In fact, Katie Wilson actually I believe is with us this afternoon. So Katie, well, thank you for your support and, uh, and I'm certainly uh, happy to see you soon, I'm sure. Um, this afternoon I am delighted to present Jane Bianco. Jane Bianco is Farnsworth Art Museum curator who has, is with us today and she will explore and tell us all about the art and the ingenuity really of Vera Bonk. Jane Bianco has been with us here at Farnsworth Art Museum in Rockland, Maine since 2008 and has curated or assisted in the curation of more than 20 exhibitions since then at the museum. Most recently, she has been hard at work and contributed uh, a lot of content and writing to the Farnsworth catalog publication, Maine and American Art. Um, just before we begin today, I wanted to mention for those of you just coming in, we will be taking Q&A uh, questions for Jane after the lecture. So if you have any questions, do please put them in the Q&A box, not the chat box. We'll be happy to get the questions out of there. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to present to you Jane Bianco. Well, thank you very much, Gwendolyn, and thank you very much, Katie Wilson, and thank you very much, Alice Tischler. Um, <clears throat> in 2016, the Farnsworth Museum acquired original drawings made for book illustrations, as well as a collection of books and printed book jackets illustrated by Vera Bach. These are the very generous gift of Alice Tischler, Vera Bach's niece. Bach's work provides an opportunity to engage in a rich narrative examining children's literature, myth, and surrealism, as well as widely disseminated imagery in association with mid 20th century detective fiction, my favorite part. Today, I hope to give you a small sense of the artistic and intellectual range of this accomplished artist, Vera Bach. And there you see her as a young woman uh, integrated into one of her illustrations. Known professionally as an illustrator, book designer and painter, Vera Bach was the daughter of an international banker and a Russian born concert pianist seen here in the photograph in the lower left. Um, Vera spent her early years in, in loving and luxurious surroundings in the stimulating culture of St. Petersburg, Russia. And she traveled with her family throughout Europe to visit uh, family and friends during summers all before the Bolshevik revolution changed everything for the family. And you see here a diagram of the family's lovely apartment with its many rooms in St. Petersburg. And as I mentioned, Vera Bach's mother, Ida, at the piano. Vera Bach here, um, I've highlighted as a, as a very young tot um, in her, uh, St. Petersburg surroundings. And here is more or less the route 
the Bach family fled um, the city in 1917. And this is the route they followed beginning on the Trans-Siberian Railway via Mongolia and China and Japan, and then across the Pacific um, to San Francisco, and finally overland by train to New York City, the birthplace of Bierbach's father. In England, um, where Vera's older married sister lived, uh, Vera Bach later studied manuscript illumination, heraldry, commercial printing techniques, all supplementing her training in painting and drawing. And her illustration book career began in 1929 in New York City. And among her early books, I will mention The Tangle Coated Horse, and uh, The Adventures of Maya the Bee. Uh, her many children's book illustration credits include The Arabian Nights, King of the Cats, The Little Magic Horse, A Ring and a Riddle, and The Oak Tree. And I suspect there may be some of you in the audience who've uh, read some of those. Um, and for adults, her most notable book decorations include those for the Quran and A Critical History of Children's Literature, which was published in 1953. Um, and then the many book jackets that drew fans of the Crying Club series. And here, um, you, if you have read the dedication, um, um, partly on behalf of her mother uh, to the book Stormy Victory, and one of the interior illustrations here with um, a reference to Russia. And you will see that her illustrations, while they may resemble prints or wood engravings, are actually brush and ink drawings. A number of Vera Bach's works have come to the Farnsworth because of the relationship established between Miss Bach and the museum under the directorship of Wendell Hadlock, one of the Farnsworth's earlier uh, directors. This was during a period when Bach was a summer resident of Lincolnville with her mother. And when their circle of friends there included artists and musicians. As Vera Bach's mother, uh, as I mentioned, um, as a concert pianist, had studied with Anton Rubinstein, Rimsky, Korsakov, and played one of Tchaikovsky's piano concertos with the elderly composer himself conducting the orchestra uh, according to family lore. So you see um, Vera Bach speaking with Wendell Hadlock in the newspaper clipping on the right. Perhaps picking blueberries in Lincolnville, I'm not sure. And it's interesting to me, um, as I explored the Farnsworth Museum files relating to correspondence with Vera Bach during uh, the 50s, that Macmillan books um, in their permission um, letter to reproduce some of her imagery in a museum flyer included imagery that uh, she had used in a critical history of children's literature. So it was a nice integration and a reiteration of her work, which obviously Macmillan books include, uh, felt were, was also very important. And here is the brochure made for the Farnsworth in 1952. Bach was conversant in the evolving print technology of the publishing industry, highly skilled in draftsmanship and subject development, practiced as a colorist, a designer of books and very good at the decorative elements. In other words, she integrated the total book into her design. And this is um, a logo that Bach designed for the museum, which was used many years um, in um, letterheads as, as well as in book plates in our Farnsworth Library books. Poseidon, ancient god of the sea. And although this uh, logo was later modified, uh, her original concept was a familiar Farnsworth brand for really three decades. 
So I'd like to spend the bulk of, of this presentation uh, showing a range of her work, um, sort of as if we perhaps might be turning pages, marveling uh, at her technique and her imagination. And this is rather um, what I would call an informal sauntering uh, through just a small part of her world. And to be honest, this is rather a personal and subjective selection on my part of work that I find absolutely enchanting. So the adventures of Maya the bee, um, the, pla the uh, plate, which is actually um, atop the book binding. And then the interior, which I think is marvelous, the title page, where the type of the text integrates so beautifully. In fact, it's woven into the backdrop of the, the floral design that uh, Vera Bach created. She was very cognizant, again, of the integration of type and image. Another early book, a much simpler kind of design, but also you notice the limited uh, color scheme, the limited palette. And then end papers uh, from Cranes Flying South, uh, translated from the Russian. A number of the books that she did over the years um, did have a Russian authorship. And that's something that I would like to explore further. Uh, here are examples of a, a small range of her work. Um, she was interested in heraldry, and there's an example of that integrated into the, the back uh, book jacket of Cinders. And then her interest in, in printmaking, though this is not a print, again, this is brushwork, and the interior illustration uh, for um, Oscar Wilde fairy tales has been also used as the part of the binding for the outer uh, covers of the book. And then more examples of her heraldry. This piece in the upper right uh, with the red touches is, I, I'm not sure, I think it may be a, a student piece. Um, it has a little note on the back, not for sale, but she did incorporate um, coats of arms into uh, here, a critical history of children's literature, a book cover, a mystery book cover, and another, um, which you will see the further illustration further on. And here you see uh, sort of a range of her ink work, an early book on the left, and a much later book with a sort of free lyrical line on the right and in between uh, sort of mixed media, ink wash, ink line, and charcoal drawing. She also, <laughs> just back to the previous one, like Wanda Gag, she was quite interested in integrating cats. Uh, cats were a favorite subject of many of her books. And here, I just think these show just how incredibly intelligent she was as far as her line work, her, her ink work, and going so easily from white line to black line in her drawings. And you can see that in the shadows here on the cabinet, and then the echoing the forms um, throughout. Her drawings were really quite clever, and she always integrated her, her monogram so beautifully. And another example of her uh, sort of raw artwork done for um, reprinting as book imagery, um, again, thanks to Alice Tischler, this is in our collection. And here, although it is all ink, you can see touches of gouache where she enhanced some of the white, but also very, very adept uh, with the brush. 
very precise. And two types of her line work, the, the very lyrical uh, drawing illustration on the left, and also more symbolic, a little more abstract. And then the one on the right, which uh, is a little more literal and very much um, in keeping with the type of uh, wood engraving type of illustration that you might associate it with. And then I think she was a master at integrating the decorative elements of the book, particularly with the chapter, the, the letter headings for the chapter headings. And this one really takes off the sinuous vine-like um, embellishment, which I think is so lovely. And then her um, east, west, south, and north integrated with the uh, silhouettes. So, and the birds carrying that away. Here's something where I think a child's imagination would also take flight looking at that drawing. And then um, some of her more um, uh, abstract and experimental work. Again, uh, it's, it's gouache, it's chalk, it's charcoal, and it's ink. Uh, Bach attained stylized illustrations in line by her beautifully lyrical brushwork, her mixed media compositions such as these. They're imaginative, expressive, and deeply compelling, I find. And they, they range from narrative composition to vignette throughout her body of work. She produced as well um, more challenging, surreal, and ambiguous tonal illustrations, which you'll see a bit later on. And although she was concerned with precision and finesse, she also produced work that was satirical and biting. An examination of her range of subjects provides an opportunity uh, for me to try to understand her work in terms of story and design, and also to appreciate um, her, her interpretations and her commentary during a very rapidly changing 20th century. And I'm talking about the world issues as well as technological printing uh, changes. Um, bordering on humor and the avant-garde, her illustrations for popular detective fiction, and concurrently for Life Magazine and, and Coronet Magazine, um, enhanced the work she built as being uh, an accomplished and intelligent artist. And here, um, again, just walking through and gazing at her work, she, she did not use color um, broadly, but rather, um, place touches of color against her mainly black and white grade work. And I think because of that, because she was so careful with her touches of color, this had even more impact on her illustrations. So a few of her book illustrations, Love Poems and Sonnets of William Shakespeare, the sort of drawing you might expect. And then um, some which uh, border again on the surreal and the more adventurous imaginative and in some cases dark themes. These are done Love's Enchantment in um, ink wash and gouache. So she, she's able to develop tones of gray here. And these are her original illustrations. Again, with very faint touches of color here. And evoking um, late medieval, early Renaissance um, gardens so beautifully. She was such a well-educated woman and so diverse in her thinking um, 
there's so much, I think, so much more behind her illustrations. And she brought this to children. And here, uh, here are the end papers where I, I get to uh, be against this, all blown up behind me, thanks to David Troop. So here is a drawing uh, for a book cover. And here is the overlay for the color part of the drawing. And here it is integrated in the final printing of the book jacket. So I wanted to show you a little bit about that technology of the time, the color separation um, and the printing. This was 1942. And here's a mishmash uh, of samples of, of the tip of the iceberg of her many, many fascinating covers for all sorts of books, not just children's books. Um, a whole range of books that appeal to children and adults alike. And then again, back to her end papers, which I find endlessly interesting. Aladdin, um, and Aladdin was done, let's see, in 1959. This is from The Little Magic Horse, 1942. Um, how clever the the night and the day. Uh, her early book, The Tangle Coated Horse, uh, from 1929. You almost see a sort of Art Deco kind of aesthetic there. Two colors. Well, actually, just one: red, and then black and white. Um, the Arabian Nights, 1946. And this wonderful, uh, the Rose Fairy uh, end paper for the Rose Fairy book. And to me, this looks like it is just one singular line that she never lifted the brush from the page. And she drew all of those things very spontaneously. Of course, that's probably not the case, but it's so beautifully wrought that it appears that way. Jock's Castle. And if I were a child reading this book, I'd be so interested in flipping back and forth between the story I was reading and the end papers and imagining myself in this world on top of this castle. And here, imagining myself in this map where had she shown the cat, cat throughout uh, the town. This is Bow Bells. 1943. And again, there's where the uh, coat of arms appears, hearkening back to her heraldry training. And then finally, uh, the lace, a very uh, convincing lace design for uh, a girl who would be queen, 1939. And this is actually uh, done in uh, a gray, a gray, just over white. So in the 1930s and into the early 40s, but mainly in the 1930s, she did participate in uh, the, the federal arts program. And you may have seen this series of stamps which came out, came out um, just a few years ago. I still have a few left because I'm holding on to them um, with Vera Box uh, design. These are not all her designs, but this one is. And this was a poster done for the poster uh, section in New York City of the Federal Art Project. So during the Great Depression, the Federal Art Project was an arm of the Works Progress Administration's relief programs. And of course, and they employed artists in various capacities to teach in community workshops, to produce public murals, sculptures, prints and posters, photography, crafts, and stage sets, and to picture the nation's rich legacy of the decorative arts through the Index of American Design, another project, pet project of mine. Um, 
Richard, and please, uh, I will mispronounce his name. <laughs> Richard Pluta uh, was a designer who had been trained in the Bauhaus and immigrated to the United States uh, from Germany. And Anthony uh, Valonis, uh, who developed uh, silk screen heads, uh, Italian um, roots. And both of them were involved in the, uh, particularly in the New York City poster uh, design uh, workshops, which were the center of the federal art programs poster, poster works for the project. And Vera Box uh, work includes a few of, of these. And so I'll show you just a few. First of all, I think her work has great impact. Here it is, much simplified from some of the illustrations you've already seen. Uh, some of this is prior to and, and some afterwards. But she's able to um, really impart great impact through strong graphics and just two colors. Um, it's just amazing. This is a wonderful composition, I believe, from 1936. These are a little bit more complicated. The history of the civic services. Uh, they seem a bit more cluttered, but they're fascinating. Um, and this is the, the history of the civic services, the sort of the waterworks in New York City. Um, as I say, fully choreographed, much like her book illustrations. And these are silk screens. Then this one, which is much more simplified, and again, I think it has much more of an impact because of that, of the illustration for the Lafayette Theater uh, for the performance of Haiti, 1938 that was. And then uh, a focus on the fire department, the evolving uh, fire forces or anti-fire forces in New York City, beginning in 1656 and ending in 1936. And I think what is wonderful, I like these better than the Waterworks series because I think she more gracefully integrates uh, the script or the type, type into uh, her designs. And the lovely little silhouettes show the action, the lovely silhouetted firemen in the foreground, just wonderful. And then um, the poster work section um, was commissioned to present a calendar for 1939 uh, for the members of Congress. Um, and this was uh, the one month that Vera Bach was assigned the month of August. And this is also an example of silk screen. Um, two more of her uh, posters. I think the one on the right uh, being the more successful one, but both of them having um, being readable and, and being of interest to whoever was looking at them, I should think. And then uh, during uh, the end of the, towards the end of the WPA, um, and I'm not sure that this was uh, WPA, um, sponsored anyway. This was a brochure she did. Vera Bach did also um, do work for commercial uh, reasons as a commercial artist. And this is the a brochure for physicians directed towards physicians. But the very romantic cover that she devised is amazing. And again, um, it's her more experimental work that has great appeal, um, as I say, bordering on the surreal, if not there. Um, this, this was an illustration done for Carnet Magazine with, um, I suspect, the um, artist's hand bursting out of the stone, giving life back to a limb. It's all about hope and, um, <clears throat> Let's see what I've written here. I see it as being all about hope. A bit more fantastical attainment against adversity. So all sorts of examples there. And this one a little bit darker, 
also from Coronet Magazine um, about idealism and reaching for the stars, though it is so much in the dark. And there's even what I think is a mole beneath her signature there. So the uh, symbolism of this, perhaps some of it um, will take me at least a little more thought. And then this wonderful book um, that she did in 1971 um, and one from my own collection, um, we have again, thanks to Alice Tischler, the, this original illustration um, from the book and then the cover, 12 Great Black Cats, just a fantastic book. Uh, her, some of her personal work, in other words, a personal Christmas card where she does have a bit of a sly sense of humor here, um, a book plate, so many artists have made book plates, of course, and then um, probably exploration into her monogram for one of her drawings. Very different tone to this Christmas card, which appeared, uh, I believe it's Life magazine, but I may be wrong, it may be Coronet or Life, um, uh, towards the end or at the end of World War or the victory of the Allies after World War II. So the Christmas tree has got all kinds of things that post-World War people were, you know, in, in the new economy, people were after. Typewriter, radio, car, telephone, uh, lawnmower, train set, roller skates. There are also DDT guns that look like syringes and weaponry. And one of course is the atomic bomb. And the other is a little child, I think, with a makeshift machine gun down there. So there's a dark side to this celebration. It's a satiric look at peace on earth. And then a book cover um, done a few years earlier in 1941 a very poignant cover, um, the story of human uh, service, the good side of humanity. And then some more satiric uh, drawings. I call these drawings, they're, you know, they're, they're worked in ink and pencil. Um, and so I use the term drawings loosely. They are illustrations for Life magazine um, and I have a copy of, of this Life magazine as well, but um, these are not good reproductions here. So you don't see the full um, range of her tones in these. Uh, but uh, Phantom Victory, if you know the book, um, was her, her, eight, her series of eight drawings published in this issue are based on the book Phantom Victory published a year earlier. In other words, before the end, uh, the end of World War II. It was a satire, or it is a satire, by Major Erwin Lesner, an anti-Nazi officer in the Austrian army who was tortured by the Gestapo before escaping to the United States in 1941. And her drawings highlight his projection of a post-war world. He's imagining, he's imagining this world and the effects of the dynamics from within Germany and a newly emergent Hitler-esque character upon the world stage in the future. Um, this was written again before the US and its allies declared victory and prior to Hitler's suicide and published uh, just a week after his death was announced. And now to my, I think this is my favorite part, though it's hard to choose. Um, on April 1st, 1928 was the publication date of the first crime club book. 
uh, The Desert Moon Mystery by Kay Cleaver Strayan in what was to become part of a distinctive series of crime club book jackets displaying the gunman logo, the gunman you see here. And here he is um, sort of picked apart. He is made up of the word crime. And so here it is laid out for you. The logo was designed by Joseph Tennell um, and he was a New Zealander, a graphic and product designer uh, with over 300 trademark designs to his credit and product design that included the Remington typewriter. Uh, dust jackets that were commissioned um, from the um, Double Day, who had the Crime Cut Club series, included notable artists um, besides uh, Vera Bach, who is a notable artist, her good friend um, and fellow Russian, and I know I'm not going to say his name properly. R.Z. Bashev, and also uh, his is on the left with the uh, skeleton hand here. And on the right, you see a cover for the Crime Club by Andy Warhol. A lot of these were done in, uh, again, from 1928 through um, the 50s. So here on the left, you see uh, Vera Bach covers. And on the right, um, an explanation of how you can become a subscriber to the Crime, crime Club in the sort of imagery of the day. And now to some of her Crime Club covers. Um, 1952, Sapphires on Wednesday. I think the titles, some of the titles today may seem a little bit hokey. Um, and some of the and sort of pulp fiction here. Um, but some of these authors are, are quite wonderful mystery writers. And her, um, her sort of tongue in cheek, um, slightly humorous designs, I think, are fitting for the times, but then, the, then again, they're timeless. So we have an original drawing for the shroud off her back. And here again, you can see how she worked in black and white and gray with uh, ink wash and um, gouache. And then how mm, the color was integrated, touches of red, just for that slight macabre feeling on the cover. Here is another um, in our collection in which she actually integrated uh, the gunman logo in pencil, in sort of great great gradations of pencil as a little um, device uh, next to the praying mantis. And then the color as it's overlaid. I actually think I like the black and white drawing much better just as it is. And then this sort of lurid um, woman uh, who is probably the murder victim here and the monstrous uh, train or car and money money on the black, which became uh, red, blue, black, and gray here. Final exposure, which we did show a few years ago in a very small display of Beerbox work. Um, her, her drawing skills are exquisite in that she's able to uh, evoke the feeling of the skull and the glass of the uh, lens of the camera, all very clever, cleverly done. And again, with the last touches of red and pale green by the printer, the opium poppy perhaps growing out of the eye of the skull. I do want to read all these books. I hope to. And here's another. And, and what they tended to do on the back covers of these books uh, was tell you in advance the type, fast action, something new, humor and 
homicide, a chess puzzle. So you'd know what you were getting into uh, before you opened the book. And I can't help bringing this in, I may be sticking my neck out a bit, but I, I do tend to see artists self portraits. And I don't know that this is, but I might imagine that it is. And this one as well. And here is Vera Bach, um, illustrator and designer uh, who illustrated books from 1929 into the early 70s. Um, and this is she here in Maine. Um, being interviewed and photographed uh, for her second um, exhibition at the Barnsworth. And she's holding in her hand uh, this uh, internal newsletter from Doubleday in which they um, commissioned her to do the cover uh, celebrating 25, the 25th birthday of the crime club. And here she has very um, humorously, I think, placed uh, frosting decorations in the form of um, tool, the tools of murder, the gun, the poison, and the knife on the edges of the cake. Um, her work continued long after her career in publishing wound down. Her relationships with talented friends, family, her world travels, and her interests all contribute to a fascinating biography of a woman who lived a very long life. And I certainly would love to write that biography. Um, as I continue with some immersive research and thought about Vera Bach, and thank you to Katie Wilson for providing this sort of jump start in thinking about preparing this presentation, I have thought a lot about the structure of a book. Um, I'm interested in her training, her range of interests and origins, her life in Switzerland, in Russia, England, and New York, summers among artists and musicians in Lincolnville, Maine, and the many projects she accomplished with such flair, including her interest in preservation. Because of her knowledge and her appreciation for art and its importance to world cultures, she felt a great sense of purpose in supporting preservation of the artifacts of civilization. She was especially concerned and was so since 1966 with the impacts of rising waters in Italy and upon the centuries old art and architecture of Venice and because of her interest in fine book press, uh, presses and their products, such as that of Venetian Aldous Minutius, active in 15th century Venice, uh, late in life, she became a significant supporter of the Venice Committee for the World Monuments Fund. And I hope that by exploring her world in the publishing design and beyond, I can one day contribute um, something to the story of Vera Bach's life and to her artistic legacy. Um, with thanks again to Alice Tischler for the collection, which has gotten us started on this uh, passage, and for the support of Katie Wilson and this opportunity to speak at the lecture today. Um, I end with this lesser known design from Vera Bach from Maya the Bee, uh, an internal decorative embellishment, which I use as a prompt to thank you and, and to enjoy the evening ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jane. That's just really a fascinating lecture and my gosh, I mean, she must have just been such an incredible personality to get to know too. It's a dry sense of humor and really quite a variety of, of her subject matter too. Um, seemed like she was constantly reinventing herself, really. Well, I think she has such a repertoire, such a range. I feel that 
there was so much in her brain and she had, you know, she was a world traveler. She knew some very interesting people. She had fascinating experiences. She had much to impart um, by way of her book illustrations, her magazine illustrations. I can imagine fascinating conversations as well, um, but I have yet to find out. Well, thank you again. And I'm, I'm gonna go to the chat box here or rather the uh, Q&A box and see if we've got any questions. And yes, we have a couple questions coming in. First one is, are there any books available about book cover art and artists in particular? So it's a good you know, general question for those who are diving deep into the subject. Uh, if you mean book jackets, I'm sure there are, and our registrar, Angela Waldron, has given a series of wonderful lectures on book binding, um, sort of turn of the 20th century book binding uh, uh, show that is still up here at the Farnsworth. And yes, um, there's a wonderful book by, uh, I forget his first name, Minsky, um, about uh, book, book binding designs. Um, from sort of the arts and crafts era into early modernist America. Yes, it's just a matter of uh, exploring um, libraries and especially special collections of libraries. Universities are wonderful places for, and university special collection libraries are wonderful sources of information. And so are librarians, <laughs> yes. I'm just waiting to see if a couple other questions come in. Um, as far as, let's see, here we go. We have a question that's just come in. Vera Bach lived to be over a hundred. So for really how long was she working in her career? I think that um, she worked from 19, uh, tw well, I'm sure she worked before 1929. 1929 is the first date of a published book that we know of. Um, she worked, let's just say she worked from the 20s through the 70s in this country. And um, after that, uh, she moved um, eventually to uh, Zurich, Switzerland. She married and she established a different kind of life as a, um, again, as a, someone who was interested in preserving art and probably um, preserving art so that mo many people in the world could still experience fine bookmaking, fine design, um, imaginations that you know are sort of sprung loose by book illustrations. I think she was all for that. Yeah, she seems really like such a vibrant artist. And, and certainly, again, she must have had many, many inspirations um, to you know, some of her designs. Uh, I've got a few more questions here coming in. Um, thanks, everyone, for your questions. Let's see. So actually, on that subject, do you know how she first became involved in book illustration and what her training was? I mean, I, I was even wondering if she, you know, some of these end papers, they really look like textiles in a sense. And um, just wondering if, if you have more specifics on what her training was. Well, I'd like to learn more specifics. As I understand it, she uh, was partially trained in England where her older sister lived. And in England, perhaps, uh, I don't know that it was London. Um, she studied heraldry. She studied um, printmaking. She studied printing, or she became conversant with print technology. And she studied manuscript illumination. Now, manuscript illumination is something that you can see evidence of that in her designs. Uh, if you think of um, medieval or, or say Renaissance or prayer books or books of hours, um, there's so much that references those sort of compositional designs as well as content. And so she's bringing um, the, the sort of the early Renaissance to the fore in the 20th century through modernist uh, sensibilities. Um, that's a very rich background. And of course the, the um, illuminations also do relate to textile design. 
Um, and then I start thinking about Marguerite Zorak, who, who did the same sort of thing. Um, sort of their lives, um, their, their years in a way, Marguerite Zorak didn't live as long, but they certainly paralleled each other during the early 20th century. Yeah. And let's see, I think I've got time for one more question. Is it possible to see these books at the Farnsworth Library? Um, not at the moment, um, just with, um, with our various parameters here are um, not at the moment. However, um, we did show some of her books um, in light of the fact that I'd like to do a book about Vera Bach, I would also like to mount a more of a comprehensive exhibition to go along with that. Um, certainly, um, they would be on display, her books. And in the future, um, I do believe it's important to have access to those books, or at least virtually. Um, some of the books are in fragile condition. Um, her artwork also um, should not be handled um, generally. So I think the, the way to go about this is to probably um, create an archival collection or a collection of archived so that it can be handled by the public, sort of secondhand. Well, again, I think that her art is just, it's so vastly appealing, I think, um, you know, to, to children and families, um, but also she had, again, a really wry sense of humor, I think, when she was doing the, the jacket covers oh, yes, for, her, for the mystery humor. novels, humor. certainly. Humor is everything. And her books are readily available. You can find her secondhand book, you can find her books in libraries, in the children's section. Um, I've had great success finding, uh, filling in gaps here in our collection at the Farnsworth and and then particular books that I would like to own, um, you know, via online booksellers, um, not necessarily expensive either. Her books are readily available, though perhaps their prices will go up <laughs> one day soon. Um, and the posters, you can see her poster designs at the Library of Congress. Um, if you go to the prints and photographs um, section, um, you can see many of her things online um, if you'd like to. And again, if you'd like to handle her books, um, please find them at a library or online through booksellers or secondhand bookshops. Even more fun browsing the shelves there. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you. So I think we've got the questions for this evening. So I want to really thank everyone for joining us this afternoon here at Farnsworth Art Museum. And we'll be sure to see you in the galleries or at an upcoming program. I also want to really thank uh, Katie Wilson and our sponsor tonight um, really for your support. And, um, and again, Jane, a fascinating subject. I'm sure we could go on for the whole evening, but uh, we'll have to uh, wait until you write more about uh, Vera Bach's story. <laughs> Well, thank you, everyone, and get outside now. <laughs> <laughs> get out and enjoy. Yeah. Thank you again. We'll see uh -huh. you next time. Bye.